what makes it a network empire instead of a network state. And I think the core, the, the core thing that Balaji, when he came up with this concept, missed is the insecurity of a future world when we're dealing with wide scale economic collapse. That is the world that we are heading into where it is cheaper for the wealthy class in our society to isolate themselves from everyone else than it is for them to ensure widespread prosperity. Would you like to know more? I am so glad to be recording these again. Our audience doesn't know, but it's actually been like a week and a half since we did our last recording because we were at this ARC conference in the UK, which is supposed to be, I don't know, like this new alternative to Davos sort of a thing, but I think it's just really conservative British Davos. But one of the people who we met while we were there and we had a long conversation with was Curtis Yarvin. And in that conversation, I really helped me clarify some things that I think about what's going to happen in the future of our species. And we may release that conversation because it was recorded at some time, but it was recorded in like a busiest restaurant with a Greek reporter interviewing us both together. So I, I can't believe that some random Greek newspaper, a monarchist newspaper, by the way, is getting the piece where it's me and, and you and Curtis Yarvin talking for like two hours. But we constantly get accused of being techno feudalists in the media and this to me feels not just like an unfair accusation but almost an insane accusation it's a bit like if you know i have some friends who their family were you know left germany early and they tried really hard to convince everyone the holocaust was coming mm -hmm. when they were just basically told they were crazy and so this family is actually descended from a guy who broke into his girlfriend's house at night took the girl he was dating and ran away. Now, they made the horrible mistake of running east to Russia Whoops. <laughs> instead of west. And so then they, for like a 10-year period, just constantly had to flee new places. But anyway, it would be like calling him a, a Holocaustian. <laughs> and people would be like, well, yeah, but even if you saw it coming, you know, they could have said, well, let's try to prevent it, right? And it's like, no, there was a certain point where he was like, look at, Hitler, this guy who was elected to power, look at what he's writing. Read his book, okay? He published this. Like, it's not vague what his plans are. And, you know, I feel a bit like that when I talk about techno-feudalism, where I'm saying it is almost inevitable at this point that something like a techno-feudalistic state is going to happen. Hmm. And we need to, those of us who do not want to be churned up by the system, need to prepare for how the world is going to change, um, both in terms of our culture and our families and economically, uh, because it's going to be absolutely catastrophic and very, very significant. Now, first, I would say when we talk about techno-feudalism, we do not mean, so there's this like Greek economist guy who keeps, he wrote like a book on quote unquote techno-feudalism. And the way that he defines the term is vague and pointless. Basically what we already know, which is that we live in a world in which large tech companies control a lot of the economic system. And it's like, yes, we know that. That's not what we talk about when we talk about techno-feudalism. We are talking about something that is much closer to literal feudalistic states. Exactly. But before we go further, we need to talk a bit about where we think the overall economy is going before we can talk about the technophilic states, uh, which are going to be major players within this future economy. So this actually was a point that Curtis made in the conversation. And after hearing it really clarified a lot of how I think about things, but it was in line with what I thought already. It just gave me more picture as to what the future is going to look like. And he said, mm, didn't catch the, future of, the future of the Western world, at least, and the, 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 the future of the Eastern world is also going to be bleak, but the way it will collapse is going to look very different. And we can mm. get to that in different videos. But the future of the Western world is going to look very similar to the current situation in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And this has nothing to do with with a race or even the politics of the country. Right. What specifically we're talking about is the on the ground reality of what it feels like to live there. Yeah. Well, is is what real collapse looks like from a we'll say a modern developed society. So yes. what happens when the infrastructure has been built? When there's electricity? There's housing? There's communities? But then things start falling apart. Infrastructure starts falling apart. Law enforcement start, start, starts falling apart. And that's what 
collapse looks like in our world. Because I think what most people's evoked set is of collapse is a road warrior. You know, it's like deserts. There's nothing out there. But no, no, no. We're we're starting. Our starting point for collapse is quite different from what people typically expect in their fantasies, right? Absolutely, yeah. And I think a lot of people, the other thing they think of is they go, oh, no, I'm being reasonable. It's not going to be like road warrior. It'll be more like a developing country. The uh, problem yeah, but no, no, we're starting no, from it developed, won't be like a developing country. And, and the thing about developing yeah. countries is that they are going up from nothing. You know, they mm -hmm. are building incrementally with every step of development, which is very different from a developed country collapsing. Developed countries collapse lead to very different cultural institutions than a struggling developing country. And mm -hmm. the, the life on the ground of a developed country collapsing is astronomically worse than the life on the ground of an equivalent of an economically equivalent developing country. So right. I'll give an example here. One thing you see in South Africa right now is very frequent enrolling blackouts. In a developing country, you are less likely to see this. The reason you are less likely to see this in a developing country is, and you do still see it occasionally, but like the regions are known, like they make sure their major cities have electricity and then the outskirts, you know, because they're building new electrical stations to sort of push out their electrical power generating capacity mm -hmm. instead of having a total net of electrical power generating capacity that is in the process of collapsing due to lack of maintenance, due to mm -hmm. political infighting, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is very different. And what it means when you have things like electricity regularly going out in a district is it means that many of the things that you take for granted, like restaurants or grocery stores, are going to look dramatically differently. Restaurants really rely on refrigeration systems. Yeah. Grocery stores really rely on refrigeration systems. These types of industries become very, very difficult to operate without private generators, mm -hmm. which can be very expensive. So that's one thing that, 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 that just like an example of the type of thing that you may not have that you would think, oh, I would have this in a developing country where they develop different solutions for that sort of stuff, like icebox type of stuff and, and cuisines that are built around, you know, local produce. Whereas in a developing, a developed country collapsing, you're not going to have that. So things like restaurants disappear, things like food distribution begin to disappear. Mm -hmm. Another thing that is really interesting that you see in South Africa right now that I think is going to be very common around the world is sort of fortresses. Yes. Like in South Africa, there are many what are called gated communities, which essentially are fortresses, but then each house itself is also fortified in a pretty significant manner. So you've basically got fortresses within fortresses. And then in between, of course, you have sort of more dangerous dead zones, but then you're sort of really looking at something that looks actually quite futile. This is this is what, when you look at an old, like, you know, medieval or even earlier sort of fortified area it looks like. You have sort of an outer wall and sort of a slightly protected area and then an even more fortified and protected area within, right? And, and this is because I think what a lot of people think of a world with falling apart police forces or police forces that are bought by organized crime, what they imagine is a world with just more like regular crime like the type right. of crime we see today. Hmm. And that is not what you see. What you see is large, systemic, organized crime, an aggressive organized crime that will sometimes collude with corporations, that mm -hmm. will sometimes collude with wealthy individuals, that will sometimes collude with the state. And not so much, I mean, you will still see random crime and much more random crime, but there is a new type of crime. And it's the type of crime we've had in the U.S. before. Like when we were developing, you know, Mobs of New York is a, the movie about back in the days when we had more organized crime or, you know, Boss Tweed or, you know, any of the... I, oh, you I mean, know you mean Gangs of New York? Oh, yes. Gangs of New York. I'm thinking Boss Tweed and stuff like that. Yeah. I and, mean, you know, we had the mob. We had the, the mafia. We had the... You know, we've had our, our share of organized crime in the U.S. We just don't really live with that right now. We have yeah. some organized crime institutions, but they are mostly relegated to uh, really high level of prominence within lower income communities. Yeah. Whereas when a state is collapsing, they are part of everyone's everyday life to an extent. And being mm -hmm. able to defend against them or ally with them. And this is where feudalism comes into play is you are choosing your allies within the state because who you are allied with within the state matters a lot. Exactly. Um, but we haven't really gotten to why we call this techno feudalism. 
and this is something we're going to elaborate more on in the next episode because there's a lot to talk about in regards to this. <clears throat> but when we look at fertility rates, the two dominant strategies right now, when I say dominant, I mean the strategies that have been very, very successful at maintaining high fertility rates are to either culturally impose uh, traditions which lower the income of members who practice that culture or traditions, which increases the fertility of that group. An example mm -hmm. here might be Jehovah's Witnesses banning their kids from going to college. I mean, there's also like practical reasons to do that because they get brainwashed and stuff like that. Like I get that, right? Like, but I'm saying it also helps with their fertility rates because it lowers their income. Another thing is to prohibit the engagement with technology. Now, both of these practices limit the technological reach of a cultural group, like the, I'll say the, sorry, they limit the economic potential of a cultural group. Well, and, and sort of widespread influence you can have, because it is those who develop tech that is then widely adopted that are going to have a lot of influence across groups in the future. Yeah, yeah. So I guess I should elaborate this word because I was going to then define economic, but I really mean economic and cultural potential a group can have. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. are severely economically and culturally limited as you make these restrictions. And the thing about these restrictions that's important to note is, is some you know religious organizations are like, oh, we'll just minorly restrict this stuff, right? Like some cultural groups. We'll just minorly restrict it, or we'll just make some minor things which lower the economic potential of our members. The problem is, is that if there are different fractions of your organization which make more extreme limitations of their members, they will outcompete yours. Yeah, we've because heard this, for example, with, with Mennonites, that the groups that are more permissive around technology also tend to see more social ills that undermine the integrity of that particular religious yes. social so subculture. the moment you lean into this at all intergenerationally what will happen to your group as a cultural strategy is you will essentially be wiped out by the most extreme luddites and i don't mean luddites as like a derogatory term i mean luddites as people who dis disengage with technology i mean that you, is you, you word it is like the most air-gapped subcultures yeah the most air-gapped subcultures and it is because uh, on a pretty linear, or I'd almost say logarithmic level, uh, from what I've seen in the data, the more iterations of your tradition disengage with technology, the higher their fertility rate will be. So as soon as you lean into this as a strategy, the iterations of your culture that go all the way with it are the ones that will be represented in the future. Yes. And so then there's other groups that don't lean into this strategy at all. Like our group, you know, we might even lean in the other direction with this. And these are the groups that are going to really determine where our species is going. And this is where techno feudalism comes from, because these groups will be far and in between on the world stage. So we talk about the concept of like a network state, right? Like the, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the concept of it. Do you want to go into it, Simone? Sure. A network state is basically a fully digital community that may use similar currency, have similar social mores or similar regulation, but there is no particular geographic concentration of where they're going to be. There may be like geographic correlation. Yeah. Simone, you had talked to me in one of your books about like time zone based yeah, um, Cory Doctorow wrote a book called Eastern Standard Tribe a while ago that I think somewhat predicted the way that communities are going to sort out. And it sort of, it talked about a near future in which social groups correlated more by the type of time zone that you kept, because that's when people were online at the same time you were, and that's when you were all hanging out. And that's obviously where the title comes from. So network states remind me a lot of that kind of community rather than what we're really describing, which has a strong yes. geographical basis. So what we would call, what we're describing is a network empire. We actually went over a few names here and we're like, well, it's not really top down. And I'm like, so it's more like the Holy Roman Empire, but unlike the Holy Roman Empire, for people familiar with your history, the Holy Roman Empire was a German empire made up of a bunch of like feudal players that were often largely under the rule of a single individual, but on the outskirts they weren't. So like 80% would basically be under a hierarchical rule and 20% wouldn't be. What we suspect the network empire to look like is it's going to be about 10 to 15 percent maybe even as high as 25 percent under a single rule but most of it will be independently ruled so mm -hmm. it'll be much more like a fractured sort of holy roman empire you can think of it mm -hmm. and 
what makes it a network empire instead of a network state. And I think the core, the, the core thing that Balaji, when he came up with this concept, missed is the insecurity of a future world when we're dealing with wide scale economic collapse. By the way, if you're wondering why we're so certain there's going to be wide scale economic collapse, you can look at any of the videos where we talk about what falling population means for the world economy. If we enter a stage in which the world's economy is shrinking on average, we are entering a stage in which most Western economies begin to collapse. Alternatively, if we enter a stage in which the world's economy is continuing to grow, but it's continuing to grow almost solely because of AI, then we enter a stage in which the bourgeoisie officially no longer need the proletariat. That mm -hmm. chain has finally been cut. And everyone under maybe like a standard deviation or two standard deviations from the mean in terms of IQ or who doesn't have connections is going to be frozen out of the economic system because people just don't need them. And they're like, no, they'll be nice. When have they ever been nice? Like mm. historically, when have ever the powerful been nice to people unless it was in their best interest? And then you'll be like, oh, well, the people will rebel. And it's like, yes, there are, for example, wealthy people in South Africa. They just buy better security. Okay. They just build better fortresses for themselves. That is the world that we are heading into where it is cheaper for the wealthy class in our society to isolate themselves from everyone else than it is for them to ensure widespread prosperity. So either AI is great, it ends up solving the economic problem, the rich end up getting even richer, but we still end up with this wide scale systems collapse, or we end up in a situation and it may not happen in a few countries. Like there may be a few countries like Sweden or Norway or something that through their like national sovereign fund, find a way out of this. Right. Fine. But it's going to happen in a lot of places. It, it, although it will probably happen to them due to, well, we, we don't need to get into that, but anyway, or we're just dealing with a global economic collapse because it turns out that AI doesn't replace the fact that populations are collapsing and we end up with a shrinking world economy. And due to all the debt and leverage that we've taken out at every layer of the economy, things begin to fall apart. Again, we've talked about this in other places. So anyway, this is just likely going to be what happens. It's wide-scale economic collapse, and this is what it looks like. Now, the reason why it matters so much that the winning strategies are these technophobic strategies and, and the reason why Balaji's predictions aren't going to turn out the way he thought they would is in a world in which security is a thing of scarcity, it makes sense for economically productive groups to cloister together. Mm -hmm. like, like just a lot of sense. Like if you're an economically productive group, you hang out with other economically productive people, mm -hmm. both for your kids and family safety and for cultural reasons and for the purposes of more economic production, because you're going to be more economically productive as a, as a group. And so this will lead to small, what we call hate, uh, essentially communities where high technology is produced, but that are otherwise defended, that likely have their own power generation and everything like that, networked with other havens that exist around the world. And that is what we mean by the network empire. Each of these havens represents a city-state in sort of this network lattice of empire. Mm -hmm. And that is where we think things are going. Uh, we do not think it is a great thing that things are headed in that direction. We think it will be a, a during the period this is happening, a darker world than the world we live in today. But I do think that from this networked connection of havens, we can rebuild a better civilization and one that is not likely to collapse in this cycle of civilizational rise and civilizational collapse. We just need to go into building the next one very intentionally mm -hmm. using the lessons we have learned from this one, which is- Well, it's of, very much carrying the torch of free markets through what could otherwise be described as a dark age because you have these different mm -hmm. techno feuds and fiefdoms, essentially carrying forward different economic specializations, but in a way that's far more sophisticated thanks to the existing technology into which we're entering this age. So yeah. we're able to sort of carry the torch of what we have. And then everyone is still able to accelerate, I think, a lot of a lot of development, maybe even in ways that we haven't been able to in the past, because in a post-collapse world like this, you know, regulatory oversight is going to ease up a little bit. There just won't be governmental resources sufficient to police people, which could actually lead to a sort of weird dark age plus renaissance at the same time. So it's a dark age everywhere you look, but when you go behind some highly fortified walls, you see, you know, some amazing innovation taking place. And that's why 
were both doomy but also uh, optimistic you can be both yeah yeah so it's a weird mix of doominess and optimism Mm -hmm. Uh, i would also say that this prediction better explains why we are so interested in far north charter city settlements (laughs) so people have heard our ideas around charter cities before and one of the core is that it is in an inhospitable easy to defend region Mm -hmm. not adjacent to other population settlements yeah you don't want to be where everyone like raids to get supplies or agricultural land or something like that you know Right. Before. Yeah. If you build like a high technology settlement in, in the center of an area that has a, a large population, that means mm-hmm. large, well-armed gangs or governments that want what you have, which is technology or mm-hmm. wealth. Alternatively, if you have one that is in the far north somewhere that a group would have to travel a, a, a very hard time to both get to and get out of, especially one that was known for extreme austerity outside of their technology, there would be no reason to ever rate it. I mean, what, what are they going to get? Our axiotal tanks, as we were joking about with Razib? They're unusable by most other cultural groups. Right. So that's another reason why it makes sense to, and, I, and some people will go the other route. Some wealthy people will create sort of opulent gated areas where they try to let in only the, the best and the brightest by their definition. And these communities will, I think, flourish for a short time until people realize how unsafe they are in terms of, of a long-term place to base yourself if you want anything other than short-term hedonism and vanity. Uh, mm. Because they are incredibly difficult to fit. And this is especially true of islands. Islands, you know, growing up before they they lost everything, my family had a, an island in the Bahamas that I would go to all the time. And, you know, when I go back to it, it's all shot up by pirates and stuff like that. And even when we were there, you know, we had to have guns and everything for pirate it was and stuff. creepy. It was really creepy to see. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, people do not realize islands are about the least defendable thing you could possibly have of their yeah. Head. No. Well, and it's and it's not just that. It's 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 the it's the extreme weather. You know, it's it's climate yeah. change. And we've 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 spoken with people who are like, yeah, I'm going to build my you know city state on an island. And we're like, I don't know, like, what are you going to do about hurricanes? And like, oh, we're just going to like raise everything on platforms. And it's like, well, okay, we what about that, the electricity? That does, work. About- that does not work. You you are. <laughs> These are people who have who have, are, are thinking very short term. They're like, yeah, or they, they haven't spent a lot of time. They haven't like spent a full year or a couple of years in the Caribbean. I, I'm guessing. Yeah. Um, oh my god and i can tell you another thing about islands they are not a good place to do anything technological because mm-mm. everything corrodes mm. you you can't even have like a desktop pc for more than a couple of years yeah seriously like all the, the electronics well and, and not to mention like all your other supplies if we're talking about also a post-collapse world in which like you know getting more towels is a little tough right like you know even we your with clothes the, your towel everything will yeah rock. when we lived in peru like right right on the coast which is kind of like any island environment would be constantly everything was covered in mold everything was degrading all of our electronics were breaking down so like imagine this like it's, it's a post-collapse world you can't easily get electronics supplies like clothing fabrics etc and then it just everything like you, you're making the the lifespan of all of your supplies artificially you know unnecessarily short it is bonkers but uh, alternatively if you are in the, the the far north everything is artificially lengthened in its in its lifetime which is it, And you can do sorts of processing that may not be possible in other areas due to the cooling resources. Like it's just so obviously the right choice if you are optimizing for literally anything other than immediate personal comfort. And what, uh, honestly, what a lot of network states right now are optimizing for without really admitting they're optimizing for is areas with a high level of government instability because that's where they're able to make the deals. (laughs) And typically far North governments or far South governments are the most stable governments and the, the governments in warmer regions are the less stable governments. And again, um, why why unstable governments? You know, yeah, they're going to say yeah now, but they're totally not going to say yes later. You're yes, going to be yeah, taken yeah. over by some other group. Anyway, it's just bizarre. You're actually bizarre. better off setting up an illegal settlement in the area of a stable government where mm-hmm. you can predict their actions than mm-hmm. setting up a legal settlement in an unstable government area. Yeah. Just, just, but anyway, yeah, uh, very excited to go further into this vision for the future. And I think the the next of these episodes, it'll be a bit of a two-parter, but also a bit separated. And Simone, I love talking with you about this. Do you have any final thoughts? I love your beautiful face. That's oh, all. That's a sweet thing to say. I love your beautiful face too. 
we were on we were on just pearly things recently and we were being sweet on each other and and i think we made everyone deeply uncomfortable because this is not you know <laughs> yeah the guy was like should i not be in between you because they sat this guy in between us they're like we're choosing where everyone sits so lore if you're wondering why we sat apart on just pearly things that was because we were directed to by the producer yeah uh, we wanted to sit together we wanted to yeah <laughs> love you gorgeous i love you too